أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين صدق الله العلي العظيم One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam enters his mosque and he sees two groups of sahaba. One worshipping, praying, supplicating, performing salah and the other studying, seeking knowledge, discussing knowledge. He looked at both of them and he said, Kilahuma ala khayr. Both of them are good. But then he pointed at the circle that is studying knowledge and he said walakin bit-ta'limi ursilt I was sent for this group to study, to spread knowledge, to seek knowledge. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized on seeking knowledge throughout the entire time that he was a prophet and he was a messenger. In fact his job was to teach. His job was to teach. Huwa alladhi ba'tha fil ummiyina rasoolam minhum يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ He was sent to teach وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He was sent them to teach them the book and wisdom and to teach wisdom. Rasulullah would emphasize on seeking knowledge and he would say that this is an, an obligation upon every Muslim man and woman. طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمًا أطلب العلم من المهد إلى اللحد. Seek knowledge from cradle till grave. It's an ongoing mission. Don't ever say that you reached a point in which seeking knowledge is not for you. It's for the younger generation. No. Knowledge knows no limits. No age barriers and age limits. It's encouraged to seek knowledge. All sorts of useful knowledge. As long as it is Useful. Rasulullah would say, Al Almu Alman, Almul Abdani, Wa Almul Adiyan. Knowledge is of two kinds knowledge of religions and knowledge of the human body, the human anatomy. And he would also say, Utlub al Alma walaw Fusseen. Seek knowledge even if it's in, in China. What was in China at the time? There was paganism, there was no religious knowledge, but there was worldly knowledge, there was science. There was mathematics. Even these sciences, it is encouraged to seek them and equip ourselves with these sciences. Wa sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We know that the founders of modern science, of the modern sciences and mathematics were Muslim scholars. They came from the Muslim nation, from the Muslim Ummah. For example, Jabir bin Hayyan is known to be the father of modern chemistry and modern alchemy. Umar al-Khayyam, he's known for his quatrains in mathematics. Ibn Sina, or known as Abyssina, he's known for his book on medicine, Al-Qanun fi tib which was taught in European universities of medicine, colleges of medicine, for 400 years they depended on Ibn Sina's book on medicine. Al-Khawarizmi was known to be the father of algebra. It was these Muslim scholars that founded the modern sciences and modern mathematics. Western civilization, they lived off of the achievements of Muslim scholars. In fact, Christopher Columbus, when he said from Spain in 1492 and he arrived 
In America, he used a compass designed by Muslim scholars. Designed by Muslims. Today, you look at the Muslim world and you think, where, where are the Muslims today? Where are their achievements? At some point in history, we were at, we were at the forefront of scientific achievements, mathematical achievements. Today, Muslims are in the back of the line. Do we have any achievements? Do we have any scientific achievements? Are we leading the world or are we benefiting from everyone else's achievements? Today, unfortunately, things have gone wrong. Education, as much as it is important and Islam puts a significance on education, education in itself is not enough. Education has to come up with, associated with upbringing, upbringing, at tarbiyah Hence, in Arabic countries, for example, in Iraq and the Gulf, the Ministry of Education is called Wazarat al-Tarbiyati wa ta'li or Wazarat al tarbi It is not enough just to have education, education and upbringing. Of course, for them, it's just a slogan because we never saw anything of upbringing. Education in itself is not enough, but to raise a generation, to upbring a generation, to culture, culture our children, teach them culture. That is something very important. To teach them manners and etiquette, and etiquette, teaching them science, math, and history, and their native language is not enough, but to culture them, to teach them etiquette and manners, tolerance for people of all denominations, all religions, schools of thought, different ethnic backgrounds, different nationalities, patience, respect for all, obeying the law, and that there is no one above the law. Respect for elders, respect for parents, how to be good citizens, and how to be tolerant of other views and other opinions. This needs to be taught in school. Not just to study math and science, but to learn these principles and these values. They have to be instilled in our children when they're young, in schools. Many schools, they offer ta'aleem, they offer education, but, but do they offer tarbiyah? But do they offer upbringing? How to raise, how to culture, culture a child, to teach them culture? Unfortunately, this is not provided in many schools. We also know that children, when they're young, they have a need to play. This is a need instilled in them. It's not just a desire, it's a need. And hence, we have several hadith, several hadith, and I gave a talk about this <clears throat> in Toronto in the first half of Ramadan, the Islamic theory on parenting. We have narrations that say, Let him play for seven years. Let him or her, both boy or whether it's a boy or a girl, let him play for seven years and then teach them for seven years and then keep them company for seven years. Meaning, take them wherever you go. I see some parents, they come to the majlis and their children are with them, their youth are with them. This is a, these are Islamic teachings. When you come to the masjid, make sure they're with you. They sit next to you. You're invited for iftar, take them with you. You're invited for suhoor, take them with you. Today, we have a culture of children staying at home or children doing their own thing and parents do their own thing. This is wrong. You as a mother, you go places, you go to a majlis, take your daughter with you. As a father, you go anywhere, take your son with you. There are things that are learned, not in a classroom, but they're learned from experience. I learn etiquettes from my father when I go to a majlis, when I go to an invite, when I go for a lunch, for a dinner, I see how he behaves and I learn from him. There are things that are learned from experience, not in a classroom. They're not taught in a classroom. Anyhow, the hadith says, Let him play for seven years. This is a need. When a child does not play, they do not fulfill the need of playing. When they're children, this, this need has been suppressed when they were children, they will take it out when they're old. 
when they become grown-ups. The need remains with them. Have you seen 75-year-old men driving Lamborghinis? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That need, because it was not fulfilled when they were children, so they have the need to play even when they become adults. No, let them play. When they're children, let them, let them play. But physical games, physical games, not video games. The problem today we have is with video games. Our children, you know, I remember when we grew up, we used to play. We used to love sports. We used to go out and play in the street with neighbors, with friends, with cousins. We had physical games. We have children, they have a need for physical name, games, not video games. And unfortunately, we parents, we encourage our children to play video games. I want to come back. I come back home from a long day of work. I want some peace and silence at home to take my nap. So I give my child the iPad, their iPad, their video games, and they sit for hours playing these video games that damage that damage their brain and they damage their bodies. No, there's a need for physical games, not video games. Also, my dear friend, seeking knowledge, talab al-ilm requires a clear mind without distractions. When there's distractions, you cannot seek knowledge. You cannot pay attention to knowledge. Unfortunately, Today, as we're advancing more and more technologically, our children have more distractions. My generation had less distractions. My parents' generation had less distractions. As we're moving forward, our children have more distractions. There's social media, there's video games. And on social media, there's YouTube, there's WhatsApp, there's Instagram, and there's, there's new apps every day. You pick up your phone and all of a sudden, two hours pass and you're on your phone and you haven't done your studies, you haven't done your homework, you haven't read. Leave homework, leave school studies, read, read. Do we even read anymore? The age of reading is gone. When was the last time we picked up a book, a physical book with pages and we read? Unfortunately, we don't. Because as soon as we start reading, we receive a message on WhatsApp. And as soon as we open the message, we put the book down and we don't return to it. We buy books. Our shelves are filled with books that we don't read. The age of reading is, is, is being extinct. It's, it's going into extinction. We don't read anymore. Our children don't read. We don't have the culture of reading at home. The parents don't read. The youth don't read. And the children don't read. This is a major problem. My advice is, and I give my dear brothers and sisters, especially the youth, I give them a personal advice that I do myself. When I read, whenever I read, whether it's on my iPad or a book, I make sure that my phone is away from me. I put it in a different room. Khalas. This, I have an hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours of reading. This is my alone time. This is my time, dedicated for me. I don't need to use my phone. I put it on silent and I put it in another room, and I don't care who calls, because nothing is as important as my education. And what I'm about to read, put your phone away, and that way you can concentrate. Today, there's too many distractions that keep us from studying, keep us from advancing, and that's why our children, they do poor in school. Today, my dear friends, Muslim families in the West face a major challenge, and that challenge is in the schools, in the public schools. You see, here in the West, they offer the best education. There's no doubt about that. No one can compete with them, except maybe, perhaps in the East, maybe now Japan might be advancing technologically and educationally than the West. That's a different story. But in the West, here they offer the best education. There are people that are willing to spend so much money just to come to Canada, to US, and to study at schools here, to put their children in schools in Canada and the US. They have the best universities, they have the best colleges, they have the best schooling system. But do they offer upbring upbringing, as we discussed? They offer ta'leem, but do they offer tarbiyah? What are they? How are they raising our children? Yes, they're teaching them math, science, English, history, 
They're teaching them the sciences, but how are they upbringing our children? How are they raising them? Are they raising good students with respect, with tolerance, with patience? Are they teaching them manners and etiquette? Are they teaching them respect for parents and elders? Are they teaching them that bullying is wrong? Now, one of the number one problems in schools in the West is bullying. They bully other children. Children bully other children for the way they look, the way they speak, if they have an accent, if they dress a bit different, they bully them. Are they teaching them in school that bullying is wrong? Tolerance for all, for all religions and all races and all ethnicities. What is right and what is wrong? Do our, do our schools teach our children this? They don't. They teach them science, but they don't teach them what is right and what is wrong. So this is one of the major concerns for all Muslim families in the West. They put their children in schools. They don't worry about math and science or English and history, but they worry about their upbringing. How are they raising our children? How are they culturing our children? You know, we send our children to school for seven hours, eight hours a day. Someone else is handling their upbringing. I am not raising my child. That is someone else. Other teachers, foreign teachers, that I have no clue anything about their background, about their religion, they are teaching my children. They are upbringing my children. They are raising our children. What values and principles are they instilling in our children? Hence, there's a, a real fear for our children. And there are some families that opt to move to the Middle East to move to the Middle East, a couple of days ago here in, in Vancouver, I gave a lecture on whether Muslim families should start moving to the Middle East. Then I presented two views and I gave in my take and I was against the idea of moving. One of my friends, he heard the lecture and he said, Sayyid, I disagree with you. I moved, alhamdulillah, to the Middle East and I've safeguarded my children. I've moved to an Islamic country and I've secured my children at Arabic Islamic schools here. And I feel comfortable. I good for you. Not everyone can do this. Not everyone can do this. So what are the what are some of the problems and what are some of the solutions? Some of the problems in public schools, I will quickly go over them and I will summarize. I, we don't have time to go in depth and discuss all of the problems of public schools. Number one, sex education and the issue of gender the issue of teaching our children that you can choose your gender gender is um, you know you're not restricted to a specific gender and your sexual orientation you can choose your sexual or orientation you are teaching our children this in school this is one two the problem of drugs many of our schools public schools are infested with the drugs. Number three, school violence and gangs, the problem of gangs. Number four, school shootings and bullying. A lot of it is a result of bullying. There are students that bully other students. These students who have been bullied, there's, there's only so much that they can take, they can handle. All of a sudden they burst and they bring weapons in school and they start shooting. This is a problem. You know, more people die in schools in the United States of America than from cancer, than from car accidents. The rate of deaths at schools is more than cancer. And it's more than car accidents. There's the problem of hijab. Some of our daughters either refuse to wear hijab or if they agree, they might be bullied. They might be harassed. In school, there's a pressure to take off their hijab. There's peer pressure. For example, to date. If you don't date, you're, you're seen as someone weird. Or maybe has inclinations for the other gender. Why don't you wish to date? There's the problem of forgetting your native language. Then there's so many other problems. Here, I've seen several community leaders in the US, in Europe, in Canada that are opting for homeschooling. They are encouraging our communities to go for homeschooling. 
to teach our children at home instead of sending, sending them to school. And by the way, by the way, all of our imam, all of our imams were homeschooled. Our imams did not go to school. They didn't go to school. They learned at home. We read about a Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayhi wa alimatun ghair mu'allam. A Sayyidah Zainab was a learned scholar, but where? At which university? At which seminary? At which school? Elementary or middle or, or high school? She learned from her father and her mother at home. Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam learned from his father and his grandfather at home. They were homeschooled. And hence, when in the palace of Yazid, he wanted to take to the member and Yazid forbid him. Some of the, you know, the ones around Yazid, they told him he's a young man, let him speak. What can he possibly say that sets you in danger? He said, no, inna, inna min he comes from a family that have sucked knowledge ever since they were children. Ever since they were children, they were homeschooled. Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. Imam al kadhim was a child in the house of Imam al Sadiq. Abu Hanifa comes to visit Imam al Sadiq. He sees Imam al kadhim Imam al kadhim was a, a, a child, a six, a seven year old child. He wanted to embarrass him, so he asks Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa, I'm sorry, asks Al Imam al kadhim a five or six year old child, several questions. The Imam was able to answer better than Abu Hanifa himself. Thus, our Imams, they were all homeschooled. They did not go to universities. They did not go to colleges. They did not study outside of the house. So we have some community leaders that are calling for homeschooling. And to be fair, we have to see the pros and the cons. And then we are able to judge, is homeschooling an option or is it not an option? Number one, you can avoid sex education at homeschooling. This is your option. It is your choice. By studying at home, you don't teach your children about gender, choosing their gender or choosing their sexual orientation. All of that is put aside. You can get rid of all of that. Number two, there's no more drugs or it becomes less likely, less likely that your child will go towards drugs. Number three, there's no fear of school violence. There's no fear of school violence. Number four, no fear of peer pressure. The issue of dating, having to date, there's a pressure to date. None of that is, is there. Number five, there's no exposure to profanity. You know, in public schools, profanity is, you know, is, is passed out as if it's free. There's so much profanity, there's no more exposure to profanity in homeschooling. Number six, there's no more wasting of time. You know, when you're in a classroom and you're learning together, perhaps you learn the material and your classmates have not learned, so you have to wait. There's a lot of waiting. While at homeschooling, there's no wasting time. You can learn faster. If you picked up the material, you could move on to the second subject, third subject, fourth subject. You do not have to wait for other students, classmates to catch up with you. Number seven, Number seven, students can move, move faster with students that they are more, with subjects, I'm sorry, that they are more comfortable with. Number eight, in homeschooling, you can concentrate on your child if they have special needs. While in public schools, they don't concentrate on, on children with, with, special, with special needs, especially for example, kids with ADD, with attention deficit disorder. They get the same attention as everyone else, but with homeschooling, you can concentrate on your child and their needs. There is flexibility, number nine, with school hours, depending on your schedule. There's more hands-on information. You can spend time with your child and you can be flexible with the hours. You could study in the morning and then in the afternoon and then at night or all at night or all in the afternoon. It's something very flexible. Number 10, there's no more bullying. There's less stress. Number 11, homeschooling builds a bond between the parents and the child. It builds a bond. And this is important for those who do not have a special bond 
with their children. It builds a bond. Number 12, there's no homework because it's homeschooling. It's all done at home. There's, there's no homework. Number 13, it's been proven that homeschoolers do better on standardized tests. Those who study at home and do homeschooling, it's been proven through statistics that they do better on standardized tests. And number 14, there's less distractions for students. When you're studying at home, there's less distractions. You're more likely to be distracted at school than you are at home. Muhammad. Now, with all good things, there's disadvantages as well. And the same way that we mentioned the pros, we have to mention the cons. The same way we discussed the advantages, we have to discuss the disadvantages. Number one, this puts more of a responsibility on parents. Now, as a parent, in addition to your chores at home, in addition to your responsibilities at home, now you have to teach. You become teacher, and administrator. You must comply with homeschool requirements and you must work with other parents. So this puts more of a burden, more of a, of a responsibility on the shoulders of parents. Number two, one parent has to stay home and the other parent works. This is difficult for parents, for families who have two incomes. The father works and the mother works. With homeschooling, one of them has to stay at home and cannot work. So you, you have to sacrifice one of the salaries, either the salary of the father or the salary of the mother. And this is difficult, especially for those that live in expensive cities like Vancouver, Canada, and you need both salaries, both incomes, this might pose a challenge. Number three, your lifestyle might change. For example, less time for chores. You must do everything on the weekends. If you're already busy, you'll become more busy and you might not have time to do any chores during the weekdays you leave everything for the weekends number four one of the problems of homeschooling is that there's no sports there's no school activities so it's a bit more boring number five parents must ensure that the child has friends outside of home because when you don't go to school your children won't have friends from school so they so you have to ensure that they do have friends from outside of the house number six it might pose up ch a challenge going to college later on if you're used to studying at home and if you're not used to mixing and mingling with other students going to ch going to college and university in the future might pose a challenge number seven there are less resources obviously in public schools they have more resources when it comes to technology, uh, books, online platforms, uh, doing homeschooling, there's less uh, resources available. Number eight, there's no award ceremonies. There's no competition. In schools, there's, there's competition. There's award ceremonies. I remember growing up, there was the spelling bee. There was uh, the debate team. Doing homeschooling, you don't have that leisure. So you have to do away with these benefits. طيب. There's a myth, there's a myth that says homeschoolers tend to be antisocial. This is simply not true. Read statistics, read reports, you will find that this is absolutely not true. Homeschoolers are just like all other students that study at school. They could be active, they could be socially active. Just because they do school at home, it doesn't make them antisocial. On the contrary, studying at home studying at home there's no fear of being bullied there's no more bullying there's no more peer pressure so you have to think of the advantages as well if this works for you good if it doesn't you have other options other options include staying in public schools but having islamic weekend school as you do in many of your mosques and islamic centers Two, you can have Islamic after-school programs. I've seen in some cities, they have an after-school program for an hour, for two hours, for three hours, it's an after-school program. The other option is to have a full-time Islamic school. And here 
In Vancouver, you are blessed. You have at least one or two full-time Islamic schools here at Azhara. You have a full-time Islamic school. This is a blessing. A lot of communities would love to have a full-time Islamic school. Would love to enroll their children in a full-time Islamic school. Here, you have that benefit. This is a great benefit. Or you can move to the Middle East, and that is also an option. But how practical is that? To pack your bags and leave, sell your house and go to the Middle East and start a new life. Is this practical? Is this easy? In conclusion, wa sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Homeschooling is a good option. In my opinion, for those parents that are afraid for their children, they're afraid of all of the dangers that we mentioned. The issue of sex education, the issue of teaching them about gender or they're choosing their sexual uh, orientation, the issue of drugs, the issue of gangs, the issue of bullying, the issue of profanity. If you're afraid for your children, then homeschooling is a good option. However, it is not the only option. Know that it is not the only option. You have to, as parents, I would stay study all of your options carefully. Don't rush. Study with your children. Seek their, seek their opinion as well. Don't enforce it upon them. Ask your children, are you willing to, to be homeschooled? Are you willing to have your studies at home? Or do you prefer going to school? Don't enforce it upon them. Don't do anything by force. Ask them. Discuss. Have a joint discussion and come up with a decision together and see which of these options works best for you and your family. Each family has its circumstances, my dear brothers and sisters. This is what I want to say at the end. What worked for, your, for another family might not work for you. Just because homeschooling worked for your neighbor, it doesn't mean it will work for you. Or it worked for you, doesn't mean it will work for your brother's family or your sister's family. Each family is different. We all have our own circumstances, our own issues. You know, some families, they need, they need two salaries. Another family is, is sufficient with one salary. So it's different. It's different. It's different from family to family. Choose what works best for you, not what worked best for your neighbor or for your friend or for your cousin. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla in the end to protect our children from all of the dangers at school, at home, outside of school. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them from shaitan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inni asaluka an taj'ala fi ma taqdi wa tuqaddir min al-amr al-mahtum fi al-amr al-hakim min al-qadha al-ladhi la yuraddu wa la yubaddal an taktubani min hujjaj baytika al-haram al-mabruri hajjuhum al-mashkuri sa'yuhum al-makhfuri dhunubuhum al-mukaffari anhum sayyatuhum wa li arwah al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat al-fatiha ma'as-salawat. Allah.